We're going to begin talking about respiratory physiology. And in this lecture, we're going to focus on the anatomical characteristics of the upper airways. The sensory innervation of the nasal pharynx, uh, for example, the hard palate is innervated by the trigeminal nerve. The ophthalmic branch and the maxillary branch, or V1 and V2, innervate the hard palate. And the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is V3, the mandibular branch, innervates the anterior, two -thir anterior one third of the tongue. And the posterior two thirds of the tongue is innervated by the glossopharyngeal nerve, the ninth cranial nerve. And the glossopharyngeal nerve innervates the posterior pharynx all the way down to the epiglottis. From the inferior portion or the lower portion of the epiglottis all the way down to the vocal cords is innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve. And the superior laryngeal nerve is one of the branches of the vagus nerve, the tenth cranial nerve, which branches into the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And the superior laryngeal nerve further divides into the internal branch and external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. The sensory innervation from the lower portion of the epiglottis all the way down to the vocal cords is innervated by the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. And the anterior glottic opening of the vocal cords is innervated by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. From the vocal cords below, the sensory innervation is, is provided by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And in regards to the motor innervation of the trachea and larynx, the motor innervation is provided by the recurrent laryngeal nerve, except for the cricothyroid muscle, which is innervated by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. So I like to think of the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve taking care of the exceptions. Because as we said, the portion below the epiglottis, or the lower portion of the epiglottis, all the way down to the vocal cords, is provided by the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, except the anterior glottic opening, which is provided by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. And we said that the recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all the motor innervation except for the cricothyroid muscle, which is provided by the um, external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Now, if we continue from the cricoid cartilage, which is approximately at the level of C6 in adults, all the way down to the bifurcation. The bifurcation is basically what we consider the carina, and that takes place approximately at the level of T5. The distance from the cricoid cartilage all the way down to the bifurcation of the trachea is approximately 11 to 13 centimeters. And we can see that the trachea bifurcates into the right main stem bronchus and the left main stem bronchus. One interesting characteristic is we can say that the right main stem bronchus has a sharper angle compared to the left main stem bronchus. And that, for example, is the reason why if a child or somebody were to aspirate, for example, a child aspirating a pebble or a coin, a lot of times the foreign body ends up in the right side of the airway. And that's because the line of pathway favors the foreign body to dislodge into the right side of the airway, just the fact that it's a steeper angle. Another interesting characteristic is the distance from the trachea, the bifurcation, to the right upper lobe is a shorter distance from the distance from the trachea to the left upper lobe. And the distance here is approximately 2.5 centimeters until the branch of the right upper lobe takes off. And it's approximately 5 centimeters until the left upper lobe starts to branch off the right main, uh, left main stem bronchus. If we were to follow the airways, we can see that the branching takes place from the left main stem bronchus to the, uh, we'll consider the minor carina, and there's a branching that takes off 
and a continuous series of branching until you get to an alveoli. And it's said that there's approximately 23 divisions of branching until you get to the alveolar sac. And the alveolar, alveolar sac is thought to contain approximately 17 alveoli per alveolar sac. And it's been estimated that there's approximately 3 million alveoli within the lung tissue, which gives approximately 50 to 100 meters squared of surface area of alveolar capillary membrane in which gas exchange can take place. So this was the anatomical uh, aspect of the upper airways, or the respiratory system. We talked about the sensory innervation and motor innervation. And we talked about the trachea, the distance being approximately 11 to 13 centimeters from the cricoid cartilage all the way down to the bifurcation, uh, which we consider the carina, in which the trachea bifurcates into the right main stem bronchus, the left main stem bronchus, we talked about the branching of the airways until we eventually get to the alveolar sac and eventually to the terminal alveoli in which the alveolar capillary membrane take place in which gas exchange can take place. For example, oxygen can be uh, diffused across the alveolar capillary membrane and enter into the pulmonary circulation and carbon dioxide can diffuse across the membrane and exit into the alveoli and eventually expired out. We talked about approximately 23 divisions and being approximately 300 million alveoli within the airways. So that was a sensory and motor innervation. As far as the blood supply, the circulation to the lungs, there's a dual circulation and it's thought to be from the pulmonary circulation and the bronchial circulation that supply the uh, lung tissue. And the next lecture, we're going to talk about the gas tensions. We'll talk about the gas tension of oxygen primarily from the atmosphere, and we'll follow the gas tensions of oxygen from the atmosphere as it enters the um, nasal and oral pharynx, travels down the trachea and through the, all the dividing airways to eventually reaching the alveoli. So in the next lecture, we'll talk about the gas tensions and then the preceding lectures will talk about the gas tensions within the circulation that's before reaching the alveoli to get reoxygenated and the gas tensions within the arterial system and we'll compare the two to see how much consumption of oxygen takes place which is the oxygen demand and we'll compare that between the oxygen supplier with in fact what's delivered to the body the oxygen delivery compared to the oxygen consumption and then we'll take a look at how the distribution takes place throughout the body uh, what blood supply and what oxygen supplies deliver to the, the vital organs of the body and what is the consumption between each organ system which is basically the balance between oxygen supply and oxygen demand